Hare Krishna Kavichandra Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining for the Monks podcast today. Well, it's a great honor. I never expected such an honor. Oh, I it's all, my honor I'm... to have your association. And, you know, since we've, I think the first time we met and talked was in Mayapur, where you shared a lot of your experiences and your ideas about Western outreach. And again, we met in Singapore. That time also we discussed. So yeah. at that time, I had not started the Monks podcast. Since then, I have been thinking that um, I should invite you. Fortunately, it worked out. Thank you, especially after the Anmashtami and Prabhupada the Parents Festival. Things must have been hectic for you. Thank you for sparing your time, Maharaj. Yeah, we had two big festivals here. A lot of personal. <laughs> so Maharaj, broadly, okay. so we were thinking we could discuss if I, uh, the Krishna, spread of Krishna consciousness, especially in Asia or could say Southeast Asia, because I believe that is an area where you are putting a lot of your energy. So is, is that, un, do I understand right? You are the GBC, for the, which are the areas broadly where you uh, share Krishna consciousness? I'm GBC officially of Japan, along with Banu Swami, um, okay. Thailand with Jai Pataka Swami, Singapore with Jai Pataka Swami, Indonesia with Ramai Swami. And okay. I've been going to China a lot but I'm not GBC there. I'm also GBC for Vietnam and those countries, Cambodia, but we haven't done much there. Oh, okay. Next. So Maharaj, if I understand right, you are, you, were inter, uh, you are from America and you were introduced in America. So how did you become, how did your main service area become another part of the world entirely? Well, let's see. After Prabhupada's disappearance, I went to Bombay with Tamal Krishna Maharaj. And then after some time there in Juhu, and it, it was, you know, those times were very chaotic in ISKCON. Mm. And uh, I went to Fiji. And so I was there one year. And that was very nice. Of course, the Indian community was very receptive to very simple people there. And we didn't get much with the Fijians for various reasons, although they love Kirtan and Harinam. Then I went back to America and the chaos was too much for me. And I hadn't never thought about Japan so much in my life because when I was a kid made in Japan meant, you know, it's going to break right away and stuff. But when I was in Fiji, I saw Japanese cars and Japanese everything, you know. So I started thinking, what kind of country is that? So I thought, if I go there, you know, there's no devotees, there's no chaos. I can just preach there. So I told Ramaswar, you know, I would go to Japan. So I went there. It took a while to get a visa. And there was a few devotees there, not much happening. But somehow or other, you know, those, the movement was still growing a lot. And so I was very fired up and we made some devotees and we, you know, just turned out. So there I was and then I became GBC of Japan in, in 87. And then it, things just happened, that, you know, I got Thailand and then Bali came up and somebody just said, take this and then Singapore. Oh. So I ended up, you know, spending a lot of time there. And That's when I was first in Japan, I used to go to Hong Kong a lot with the Mount Christian Merge. And so later I went to China and got pretty involved there also, but as a preacher, not a GBC. They're, they are very oh. good organized GBC people there. So and that's that how means, I got there. Oh, so that means you're almost been there for now 40 of 45 years because you said soon after. Yeah, I went in about 81 to, to Japan. Okay. And, and then the uh, other places, you know, I used to stop in the other places on the way to India actually, and then they just kind of came about. Oh, okay. So do you still have a base in America or you keep mostly traveling and 
in these parts of the world. No, itself. I never. I had, and this first time I've stayed in America for a long time. I would just come through to get visas <laughs> for oh, Africa. Okay. It's the only place we could get them. But, you know, I kind of felt like maybe I could help out. So here I am now in New York. Oh, okay. So overall, we, I mean, I, by we, I refer to the mainstream is called discourse. There's a lot of discussion about how Krishna consciousness in the West is, is almost, uh, if not dying out, it is diminishing at, uh, at a speed of increasing concern. So, and there are a lot of discussions about what needs to be done to adjust that or to, to what, whether we need to change certain things. But generally, we don't discuss much about Krishna consciousness in other parts of the world, so much how it is growing or whether it is not growing. So do you think is this primarily because in the West, Krishna consciousness was flourishing at one time and then it has gone down? And, that, and because Prabhupada considered America to be the most important country? Uh, so means there is concern about Krishna consciousness in the West, but that, that level of concern, uh, the status of Krishna consciousness doesn't seem to be there for other parts of the world. The, of course, I'm speaking based only on my experience, but what are your thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, but some other parts of the world, you know, it's growing really, really big. Yes, Maharaj. You know, when I went but, to the Middle East, I was amazed how, how much it is growing in the Middle East. And then, yeah, and of course, it's, yes, Maharaj. it's the Indian people, though. Yeah, of course, that is true. So when you're saying some, sorry, when you're saying some other parts, are you referring to Asia also in the areas where you? But say like Japan, when I first went, it wasn't like we got thousands of devotees, but we got like 10 or 12 really strong ones. And we did a lot of book distribution. Then they had that, they called it the bubble economy. You know, it was okay. growing, and then the yes. bubble burst. Yes. At the same time, they had this crazy cult, which they called the New Home Religion or something. And they got like unlimited publicity about the cult. And it was a very, really a cult. <laughs> and oh. made people really afraid of religion. And that went on for many years with publicity everywhere. You know, every television, if you turn on television, it'd be three shows about out of eight channels about this cult and what they was doing. And so it really slowed us down. The devotees got afraid to go out. People would always think we were in that. You know, they, Japanese lump things together. So religion is religion, you know. So we really slowed down. But now in somehow the last couple of years, the young people are not so much aware about that anymore. They've heard about it, but it's no big deal. So all of a sudden, we're starting to get a lot of young people. They just gave me the report. We finally got, you know, Bhagavad Gita printed. They had, they, they distributed since they came, which was not so long ago. But they've distributed 7,000 Bhagavad Gita's already. And devotees oh. got really in. Uh, That's impressive. Yeah, and mostly that, yeah. So a lot of yoga teachers <laughs> and yoga students, but a few others, and they just really broke it open. And so that's very encouraging. And so we do have activities all in different parts of Japan. Tokyo is a big temple, Indians built, but then we have devotees preaching in Nagoya to some extent, Osaka pretty big. And Fukuoka, not Fukuoka, Kyushu, not Kyushu, wait, Okinawa. Okinawa, very big. It's a, it's Japan, but it's not exactly Japan. The people are much different. So that's going. China uh, just took off. And Mara, China, just one minute, if you don't mind. You know, we at least like to, if uh, I would like to respond to some of your points and I'd like to understand them better. So Japan. If we, this is quite fascinating from what, at least whatever I read of Prabhupada's times, Prabhupada went there 
and he did do some preaching over there but uh, you said that over the years it has it has been growing and you said so sometime we were characterized like a cult but now that we have outgrown that label was that what you say and that's why young people are becoming open and attracted through the yoga yoga channel yeah everything changes you know so the whole japanese people have changed a lot because uh like when i first went there weren't very many foreigners there are just some american english teachers and they could make big big money there so a lot of you know americans were there teaching english some of them were devotees that left to teach english <laughs> but uh but oh. now there's foreigners everywhere so many chinese and they're working there living there studying there and then because they had such a restriction on families they had to import a lot of uh labor from southeast asia so it, it's much opened up and then they have all the american movies and television and japanese started traveling a lot so the young people are much different now Mm. So the ones that are coming are we don't have ashram really but they're just there many of them are yoga teachers they have their own studios and they are very influential oh, to okay. tell the students to read the bhagavad gita so they're selling them by the boxes and so one of our our one brahmachari has been going door to door to the buddhist temples for many years and made a lot of friends and now some of them are buying whole boxes of bhagavad gita they're very rich the buddhist monks oh buddhist monks are ordering the bhagavad gita yeah they're buying them by the box some of them to distribute why would they want to distribute that's amazing means they don't see um, another culture another tradition or what how do they see no, you know there just some of them are philosophically inclined and they want to know something in china there's buddhist monks in thailand also senior ones they read bhagavad gita oh. they don't give it to everybody but they study it so these things are happening things are opening up people are not so caught up in their things and, and he, he, he this boy just told me they had a really big offering for vas puja this year bigger they've never done before like 180 preparations so he took it around and the monks loved it <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so this was where maharaj in tokyo around tokyo oh my god i mean he oh. used to have boxes and boxes of maps to find all these temples way up in the mountains and everything Oh, and they, okay. they would give donations but gradually you know he made friends with them and they read the books and so some of them are just yeah. oh okay and I, we met some monks in china that are also like that they actually study bhagavad gita they chant hari krishna and china is a different story yes maharaj yeah. let's focus on japan then we'll move to china i'm just fascinated by this so is this you you do consider this like a interfaith initiative or is it more of a outreach initiative because generally people committed to other traditions when they take our books do we expect them to become devotees or do we expect them to appreciate us more so that more doors may open for us to do outreach or how do you see this as contributing to the growth of krishna consciousness it's you i would say remarkable and even unique but how do you see this moving forward well i have you know kind of simpleton and i always book distribution book distribution that's how i was brought up you know and propad was always book distribution and this will spread the movement so somehow when i was first there uh japanese you know they they are japanese and they work hard and just a small group but they went really wild for book distribution and for a few years we distributed so many books up until 87 when this cult thing hit and it wasn't that they were focusing on us it was this other cult they got a lot of publicity and so the japanese people were just afraid of anything religious 
and they would think we're these people, even though you know we're completely different. So book distribution went way down, and then, but the books were there. You know, we distributed so many books. So somehow or other, in the last four or five years, people started coming forward, wanting to get initiated. For a long time, we didn't get any new devotees. But then the Indians came. Also, when I came, there were no Indians in Japan. Just one small group, in two, two cities, a few restaurants. Most of them were cooks in the restaurants. But with the IT thing in the year 2000, many, many Indians came. And that's good in one sense, but then it also, it's not easy to mix the Indians and the Japanese. Oh, okay. It's just the nature of people, you know, psychological nature. Yeah. Japanese, they like the monogamy. So, but now, because there's so many foreigners everywhere you go, Russians, Chinese, so many that uh, it's not like that anymore with the young people. They're used to being around foreigners. So they're comfortable. Oh, okay. And I just took it as a result of all that book distribution. It came later, you know. Somehow the results are coming in. We don't know that some of these people's parents had the books in their house or something. You know, what, how it, but we know it works. We, so now they just got on fire with the Bhagavad Gita. And now the challenge is, is we're behind on book production. We only have one volume of the Bhagavatam and, you know, it's kind of depressing, but we have to get to work on that. But now that they're really enthusiastic, it's happening. So it's just the whole atmosphere of the country. It used to be that people had great respect for monks and you just say, I'm a monk and they like to give a donation, not so much care about the book. It, it, now, there's been so many corrupt monks and so many things so that people are not like that so much anymore. But there's actually a lot of people really interested in some knowledge, spiritual knowledge. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's a, another world. So it's almost, in, in America, uh, I've noticed the same thing. You know, uh, sorry? some people are really interested in it, just serious, you know. I was walking down the street here in New York a couple of days ago, and one guy, young boy, came up and said, you remember me? I said, I saw you. I remember your face. I saw you at, at Union Square. I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita. I really like it. Okay. But, and then yesterday, I was walking along, and one guy was coming in no shirt, kind of like, you know, I don't know what. Nice looking boy, but... It's cold out, no shirt, smoking a cigarette. And he saw me, jumped up there. Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, I love you, I love you. So, you know, things are happening. But I'm, in Japan, it's just like, when I just heard this recent book score, I thought she made a mistake when she said 7,000. I thought she meant 700. But just in their John Mastami Marathon, they distributed 2,000 Gitas or something. That's amazing. Which is haven't done that in the last 20 years, practically. So Maharaj, books have been let me, yeah, yeah, so, sorry to interrupt. Everybody wants to do it now. All the, all the new devotees want to distribute books. So, and they're, even the Indians are doing it. That's wonderful. So Maharaj, uh, when the Indians see that Japanese are coming, they, they get enlivened, <laughs> you know, and they feel more faith in their cultures yes Maharaj. Mm -hmm. that's it's amazing so two three questions the first is that uh, so it seems almost like even in these countries is in japan it's something similar to what is happening in india if you go to the rural places still if you're just a sadhu people respect they may not have money to give donations for books but they respect and they take books also but the the younger generation who are into software and the whole new since 1990s onward India became liberalized. So now we have a younger generation with wealth and many of the problems that come, come with uh, say increasing liberalization. So they are interested in, in spirituality from a very different perspective from the traditional cultural perspective. 
so even in our even in india we are seeing that that say there is a demographic shift or you could say psych, almost like a psychological shift in the kind of demographic we are attracting for 20 30 years ago and what they are we are attracting now so it seems that this is almost like a global trend so do you see this increased opportunity or increased interest so are there some challenges because it seems that as we as people become more you could whatever word you want to modernize westernized post modernized they seem to be skeptical about institutionalized religion so is that a obstacle in japan also uh, do we if we say we are from india and we are practicing krishna bhakti i uh, do does that uh, obstruct them or intrigue them or you present ourselves primarily as yogis and as uh, yogis or how do we present ourselves i don't know how these devotees are presenting themselves but uh, okay you know we did all our book distribution back always in, in devotee clothes and shaved heads and everything people okay. like that still there it's they don't respect monks like they used to but still the pious people do most of the cultivation of these new devotees is done in the homes of the older devotees who got after i, I remember i had friends with one professor when i was first there he was the uh, dean of the tokyo foreign language university and specialized in bengali he was translating you know books into bengali dictionary japanese bengali dictionary and he was very favorable but he said japanese won't mature you know until they're like 50 years old so somehow or other the devotees who were very enthusiastic book distributors when they're young and then they had householders but they just started preaching at home and cultivating people in a very casual way you know uh family life play with the kids play with the cat you know whatever they have cooking in the house you know because in the house the guests can help and do everything you know in the temple there's all this formality so it's hard to cultivate people and we don't have a big you know compound where you can go sit off somewhere so that type of cultivation is what's really working Oh. and then they all pick up on it you know it's kind of like a namata bhakti riksha in unformal at the t- at the moment but it, it's just by these friendly relationships also by kirtan a lot of musicians came and a couple of the devotees are you know super good musicians and they just organize kirtans and get everybody chanting and like in japan when they made kirtan mela they didn't just invite like a few superstars that they had everybody chant for 15 minutes or half hour every guest everybody you know and they really love it they really get into it you know and they become very close and intimate that way i was i like that program and of course prasad i'm cooking classes and bringing in a few people some of the japan one japanese monogi is you know soup cooking class and and another indian monogi also is teaching cooking in big big japanese cooking schools so you know different things like that work uh, okay running the institution is you know with the internal conflicts between devotees is always troublesome okay so what if i understand that what you are saying is that uh, there are multiple channels which devotees are opening and uh, different channels are working in different ways yeah so overall how, what is the main obstacle you see for say let's if you focus on japan right now primarily uh, i know that uh, there was some influence of indian culture in malaysia indonesia and maybe sa- other parts of southeast asia but is there is there some influence of indian culture in japan you know we could say buddhism is there but buddhism i think it went through china to japan and it became quite transformed from its roots so how is india and indian wisdom or indian culture overall seen in japan 
Uh, I don't know exactly, but you know, when we'd always say this is Indian philosophy in the books, and people, you know, a lot of people really interested in that. Um, okay. And so generally you never know, like some of the Japanese devotees or Japanese people don't like Indian food. I said, why are there so many Indian restaurants? And, you know, <laughs> so people, but they all have their different ideas. So I just try to encourage every, anyone who wants to do anything, just do it, you know, and whatever technique they want to use, whatever style they want to use, because whatever it is, it works, you know. So they're having a lot of music classes. One girl had like 12 people learning harmonium at the same time and Murdunga classes and harmonium classes. And somehow they're really coming forward. And there's a few other groups there. One is, is a group called Bhakti Marg, Swami Vishwananda or something. I don't know he's, where he's from. I heard he might have been in ISKCON at one point somewhere. So they talk about Bhagavad Gita, but they don't have a Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So they 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 buy from us, <laughs> you know. Oh. So the, okay. Yeah. So people are hearing about the Bhagavad Gita a lot. Somehow or other, it's become well known. And, but that's in America, also. It's just mysterious. But I just personally find it. You know, I thought right away when I saw your questions. The biggest difficulty is our own false ego and prejudices. Of course, in foreign countries, there's a language. You know, thing. That's interesting. Huh? You said false ego and prejudices. Can you explain what yeah, the prejudices yeah. in this context? Yeah, well, we go and we think, oh, these people are like this. These people are like that. You know, we have prejudices. Can't help it. Uh, have to overcome that. They have prejudice. I, I okay, so, so when you say that. if we have prejudices, what what can you give an example of what our prejudices might be in this context? Well, just to think Japanese people are like this or these people because they're different, you know. Uh, for preaching, there's no difference anywhere I've been. You just preach the philosophy of the soul and the supreme soul and everybody likes it but when you get it when you get people and you want to organize and manage every culture has such a different way of doing things and you know it doesn't it might not seem right to us no this is not the way to do it you know we have to do it this way and they may think your way of doing it is not japanese or not balinese or not african or wherever i go you know but uh, if we can just, like Prabhupada, he only saw the soul in everyone, and he never considered what kind of body they had or what kind of background they have, or all he saw is they wanted Chanari Krishna. So he got through to anyone immediately, and he could bring everyone together. So we had to seek that out. That And when you go in a foreign country, of course, they, they have experience sometimes of being exploited. Uh, you know, or they're expecting something. So this is a factor for sure. Yes. But Lord Chaitanya and Lord Dinshananda are unlimitedly merciful. So if we can depend on them. So if I understand right, what you are saying, Maharaj, is that here when you're talking about prejudices, it is more of our conceptions of hmm, of how these some people we we as even as devotees we may have certain stereotypes uh, about uh, about how different uh, people may be from different parts of the world, and those stereotypes might come in the way of our giving them a proper opportunity for sharing Krishna consciousness. Like for instance, I go to Africa. Yes. Now, I don't know how much you know about America, but my mother's from rural Georgia. That's the deep south. So, you know, her parents, I think, even had slaves or almost slaves. Uh, 
So I heard from her so many times, these niggers is, you know, I don't want to repeat the words, but these dirty, these stupid, this, this, that, you know. And then Krishna sends me to Africa. And I have to, con not, I pretty much got over it, but if it ever a conflict comes, I just, those things just flash in my head and I have to smash it down, you know. So there's one example of how these things can influence us. But um, Japan, you know, not so much. Uh, so Japan, but, uh, so, so when you're saying stereotypes, you're talking about something like something Prabhupada, like yeah. uh, that means Prabhupada. we based on our own sorry based on our own cultural upbringing we might yeah. have certain stereotypes it's not that because of krishna consciousness we get certain stereotypes rather it is by our past upbringing we might have certain stereotypes about certain people mm -hmm. yeah like but you know fortunately we have our philosophy so if people hear the philosophy they hear they read but like Prabhupada said when he got to america how can these people, they're absorbed in so much sense gratification. If you go to Tokyo or something, it's just a really bewildering place how much sense gratification. Everything works perfectly. You know, there's never a hole in the road. If any bump in the road, they fix it at night. And the trains are exactly on time. And, you know, and everybody's packed in like anything, you know. And Tokyo is like the most densely populated rural uh, city area in the world or something, 5,000 people per square kilometer. So they get along, but not intimately. They just have to live in such crowded conditions. It's a lot of anxiety, but people want Krishna. Everybody wants Krishna. So, mm -hmm. so I'm just uh, okay, yeah, trying. Nirvisesha Shunyavadi, you know. The Shuni is a Buddhist. So if, but now the young people, they have very little, you know, uh, Buddhist training or anything. They never really studied Buddhism. And a lot of people, a lot of them have been to India. They really like India, you know, because they get relieved of all India is like nice. Mm. So, so Maharaj, um, overall, uh, how is your approach with respect to because the, you are quite a lot of areas where you are the looking after you are serving as a GBC. So is it that devotees become inspired on their own to do certain things and then you you broadly encourage them or do you give a vision and they implement it? It means is your overall approach like decentralized or centralized or uh, because it's a way, even within South from what I can see. Japan is one place and there are a lot of places. So each of them may require a different approach or somewhat different approach. So how do you, how, uh, what, what, how do you see your role in the outreach over there? Is it that you give a vision and an inspiration or you, you see yourself more as like supervising what they are doing or you are also at the ground level, actually, like you said, you, you are doing Harinam and uh, other things in New York. So do you Harinam distribution? So how, how does it work? Because these are very broad countries and very, uh, I, I presume, quite different cultures also. Well, say Japan, when I first went there, there was a couple of Japanese devotees. They were not very cooperative. And there was one American trying to do things, but he was working really hard outside, trying to support everything and he had three children. But he couldn't, he had to go back to America and then somehow some new devotees joined. So there was nothing else to do except go for Harinam and, uh, you know, distribute. The, we didn't have any books, only one magazine. But somehow Christian sent people and then we got some books done. And so I had that vision more or less was just distribute the books, you know, because we need to get devotees. and. Mm. And we did a lot of Harinam. Everybody would, was, and I was pretty energetic. And I can't even believe it when I think back. But you know, we did. I went on book distribution a lot. Uh, we went on Harinam every day, and we had really nice festivals and stuff. 
it, it changed a lot. Things changed like after this cult thing, and then then so many all of a sudden so many Indians are living there, and they started coming to temple, and then they uh, they got inspired to get a new temple and get Radha Krishna deities and everything. So things changed a lot, and I didn't have that much influence on anybody's what it, you know except to just try to preach so i just encourage everybody whatever they're trying to do and i said going really off the rails which is not very often and i just the japanese had a little trouble working you know internationally but i just encourage them preach you know preach to japanese people we're in japan you know Indians are 0.003% of the population or something. But the temple, it's the huge, you know, huge percentage. So, but, uh, so they just really got into preaching and teaching Bhagavad Gita in the yoga schools and kirtan seminars or something. People like kirtan, it's popular. And all of a sudden, they just started getting a lot of devotees. So I just keep whipping, you know, do it more, do, keep going and hope everybody else will follow their example, which is happening. Japanese are like really smart. And when they get going on something, they really get into it. So, you know, if you get them chanting Japa, they really concentrate and then they get really purified. And they love kirtan like everybody loves kirtan. And they all went. They all went and bought harmoniums and speakers to go on Harinam. All these new ones. <laughs> and they're mostly girls at first, but now it's some boys coming along. Us. Oh, that's fascinating. And uh, so overall, when we maybe we'll discuss some more time about Japan, and then we'll move on to other th- topics, uh, so maybe other parts of the world. So two things. So. Does the, in, in Japan, when you, you mentioned earlier that people are more comfortable with, say, living outside the temple, having their own families. So, so there were that, but you also mentioned that there have been Buddhist monks and so monkhood itself, how significant is it a part of the, part of the religious landscape or spiritual landscape presently? Uh, are there some similarities and differences which people perceive between, say, Iskon monks and Buddhist monks? You know, Bhakti Marg Maharaj was on a podcast with me and he mentioned that when he travels across uh, Canada, he does his walks. And he says often people ask him, when they say he's a monk, they, they, they see monks as somewhat quite cool. Whereas Catholic priests are often associated with child abuse. Monks are seen as quite cool. So he says people ask him whether... Do you, do you know martial arts? What all do you do? <laughs> so... You don't get that in Japan. You don't get that, okay. <laughs> the Buddhist monks, you know, like most of them eat meat, they drink. They're businessmen. They get a lot of money. They invest their money, you know. They, and they do rituals, you know, and... Every temple has a cemetery and people pay the monks to do ceremonies for their ancestors and stuff. So, but still people think, you know, they have idea about monks. So, but now, I mean, there's no, we have one brahmachari in Japan. And when I first joined, of course, a few joined and they were brahmacharis, but the rest of them all got married. But uh, he stayed brahmachari all this time. 40 some years and still preaching, distributing books, and even though he's 65 years old or something. But he's the only brahmachari. <laughs> you know, oh. So the rest of them, yeah, it's not like we have a monk culture. We, we don't really have an ashram at the temple anymore. Uh, and oh. we don't have facility, physical facility to do that and really cultivate people. It's good for festivals. It's good for, you know, coming and worshiping and all that, Uh, but it's formal. And, but in the home, and that's what they're finding everywhere with this Bhakti Riksha, you know, 
I, I know in England, they had saved money in South London to build a temple or East London. And they started the Bhakta Vriksha and they'd abandoned the idea of a temple because they were making so many devotees by all home programs, you know, where you can really sit down one-on-one -on -one and small groups and really cultivate people and really get into the whole, whatever they like to get into, you know, whether it's kirtan or studying the Bhagavad Gita. And then one of our boys, he's a householder, he's one of the senior devotees. He's getting so many yoga schools inviting him to give Bhagavad Gita classes. That's fascinating. So when you see yoga, you, uh, so did yoga also become big recently or it has been big for a good amount of time also? In the West, in I, that part of Japan? I don't know how many years, but it's, it's not such a long time that it just became everywhere yoga. Hot yoga, this yoga, that yoga, you know. And that's kind of in many countries like that. And then when people, if they actually practice asans and they get a little advanced, they they get a little in this mode of goodness and they realize there's much more to it. That's you know, what is the real goal of yoga? Now, and if from teachers, in the teacher training, they always, part of it is yoga, is Bhagavad Gita. Philosophy, you know. The teacher training, they study yoga philosophy and they study Bhagavad Gita. Oh, okay. So, so they know Bhagavad Gita and they want to know more. So they don't they see want... us as sectarian, but they see us as sources of uh, teaching the message of the Gita? Something like that. I, I'm not sure how they see us, you know. Okay. But I just if, if, it, It's just that, you know, in the 45 years or so that I was there, we would go, and in the beginning, I had a pretty big group, like 15 devotees, all young and jumping like crazy. And we'd do Harinam for a couple hours. And if anyone even looked at it, you'd get excited, you know, like somebody even noticed us. But now, even we go one or two at a time, people are coming up and what are you doing and what's this all about? And, you know, this has been in the last 10 years, maybe. It, it's just changing a lot. Um, like everywhere in the world, I guess, especially uh, after this, all these lockups and everything, you know, people are realizing something's got to be beyond all this, you know, sense gratification. So even oh. even and uh, so you know it's just working. They're, they're fascinated. We have online classes. A lot of devotees come. In. Online classes are very nice because we can get people from all over Japan. Mm -hmm. With just one temple, I'm trying to tell them. See, we need many temples. They don't have to be big. The Indians kind of want big temples, fancy temples, you know. But in order to preach, we need many, many, you know, like I was telling them, like, if McDonald's just had one gigantic McDonald's that fits 5,000 people, and where would they be? You know, they have them everywhere. Starbucks is everywhere. And we ought to be like that. It doesn't have to be big. Just open up your house. Invite one person. So some of them even have people spending the night at their house and living with them for a few weeks or something. And just do it. You can see them on on these online kirtans, kirtan for world peace, and this. The Japanese devotees, some of them have become very popular. Okay, so so overall, do you see there is there is some concern among some devotees that when people come from the yoga yoga side, uh, they they are already quite in bodily consciousness, and whether they will rise upward or not. That happens open to question. But then another perspective, perspective is also that even they're in bodily consciousness, they are actually getting appreciation of the broad Vedic culture and they are coming towards Sattva. So in that sense, it is good. So what are your thoughts about yeah. that? I haven't heard that anybody's worried. You know, in some places they find, you know, it's not like the temple is promoting yoga or something, but we go to the yoga people and they're interested. They love kirtan, and you just tell them what yoga is, a yoga ladder, you know. 
and the asana is one step, pranayama, then dhyana, then dharana, or dharana, part dhyana, you know, samadhi. So they like that. Oh, um, okay. I don't know. So I haven't attended the Japanese yoga classes, so I don't know exactly how they preach. I know how I do it in Ch in China. Oh, okay. You know, just, uh, I think I'm really eager to move on to China, but just one question. So you made a significant difference a significant point here that it's not that we are teaching yoga in our temples rather they are inviting us to speak and at their forums we are going and speaking so if yeah, they our if yoga you... kirtan you know <laughs> so oh, okay. i got two things started when they got to temple i said you got to make kirtan melee 12 hour kirtans 10 hour kirtans you know so people can come and go as they please and that brought a lot of japanese in and we'd let every one of them lead for 15 minutes, anyone who was willing to do it. And it really opened up everything and, and really loosened up the relationships between the Indians and the Japanese also. That's more kirtan, more kirtan, wherever it's inside, outside, it's in the street, in your house, in their house, their yoga school, but kirtan, but then philosophy also. Oh, okay. You know, so they know what they're doing. You know, it's that's amazing. It's so, um, two, three different uh, things. Uh, two things before we maybe move on to China. So, so overall, do you, if you, you know, if you want to define success of our outreach, so one thing which you mentioned is you you mentioned several times is the number of books distributed. That is one significant marker of success. From what I have read in Prabhupada's Lilamrut and other places, it seems that Prabhupada, when devotees gave reports, it was one of book distributed. And of course, another was uh, temples being built. And third is that maybe how many devotees, how many people became devotees in terms of either coming for the programs or becoming initiated. So in, in the outreach in Japan, uh, which definition of success do you consider as, pri as primarily indicative of the effectiveness of our outreach? Well, book distribution, of course, but then uh, the Japanese are getting initiated. This, and now we need to work on getting more of the Indians initiated, uh, you okay. know, culti actually cultivating. Most of the Indians that are initiated, they kind of were already cultivated in India before they came. But they have to get into cultivating, make not just donations. The Japanese, they're uh, like I said, they're it's a very family, very friendly affair. The way they work with each other, the way these devotees preach to new people, and they just bring them in. And then after a while, they want to get initiated. You know, they just they start chanting, and they just read the books, and they come up. So I've got two initiations coming up and soon two new ones. One Japanese girl and one, I think he's Japanese, but he's from Brazil. <laughs> you know, oh. Japanese. So, he's, sorry, he's, he's a Japanese guru or what? what sorry, I don't get what was the word? No, it just, there's a big Japanese community in Brazil. And oh, some of them, in Brazil, okay. Some of them moved to Japan. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, so it turned out he'd been connected for 20 years with devotees, but he didn't. He only recently met devotees in Japan. He was connected with some kind of radio show that just plays kirtans and stuff on it. Some Hare Krishna oh. radio. Anyway, they're coming. And that's, that's amazing. And uh, overall, more more Japanese yeah, sorry. at any level but working towards initiation because it's Japan, you know, there's 120 million Japanese. Oh, that's a, that is a significant yeah. number. Okay. Yeah. And Maharaj, how much do you see, say, uh, temples as important for West, uh, for, now, I don't know, what do you call it in Japan? We'll call it Western outreach, or you can just say Japanese outreach. How important do temples play a role? Because especially in India, 
uh, temples are very significant and many devote many projects are centered around building big temples now uh, in the you know west as far as america is concerned uh, there are different opinions temples do attract indians but I, but how effective are temples in attracting people from the local demographic is open to question so how do you see the role of temples in in japan well like you said it attracts indians hmm. and that's good in one sense because we want them to they are souls and they're pro, like probably said the covering and the indians is not so thick but they need cultivation also so if we take it that they just want to come and see the deity and go away uh, we want to cultivate them and that that's but that happens but it's not like india of course you build a temple Lokana Swami built that temple in a remote village and immediately thousands of people are coming. Every temple they build in India is like that. Now, it wasn't like that in the beginning. I was in Juhu in the beginning and hardly anybody was coming. But gradually they saw how nice it was and then there were more and more coming. But for the local people, you know, we have to be personal. We have to get out. We have to meet people, let them know, you know, what, and make friends with people. They're not going to come just because the deities are. Okay. If they do come, they're looking for they're looking for knowledge. They're looking for a new life. They're looking for something. When they come, even if they come to the temple, because that's the address they find. They're not coming just to give a donation to the deity and go away. You know, they they're looking for Krishna. So we have to be there to give it to them. We have to be. We have to be personal, we have to be loving, we have to all those things and be like Prabhupada. That's and then the temple, they like to come to the temple. They like to see the deities and the, you know, the nice atmosphere and everything. That's also good. But especially more than that, they need the personal care in the one-on-one -on -one or you know small groups, which is what's happening to Bhakta Vriksha, you know in uh, many countries and even in india they have i saw noi they had like 30 some bhakti riksha programs or something you know where people study in small groups and they really there's similar types of people get together and be comfortable in somebody's home and you know not having to worry about all the formalities mm. so but temples are great for festivals and you know, like you said, attracting the temple, the Indians. And, but it doesn't necessarily attract, at least in, in any other country, the same way as in India. Okay, so you are saying that more than, if I understand right, more than the culture, culture of seeing the deities, the temple is also a place for a, a spiritual community building where people feel it's welcome. Supposed to be, it's supposed to be an educational institution, you know. Right. Yeah, that is true. Cultural conquest, you know. Temple, it should have, you know, playgrounds and, you know, cooking classes and so many things like like the manor or something, you know, where they have so many different things going on. Mm. Can't always do that. Like Tokyo, it land costs a fortune and it, it's so packed up. Oh, so that's itself a. I've heard about this challenge. Even in, say, even in America, also the Bhakti Center is growing. And Brooklyn, you are also in Brooklyn. For devotees to yeah. come and stay anywhere nearby in that area is almost impossible. It's so expensive. Yeah. Going up, up, up. Brooklyn is amazing. You know, now across the street, there's a Holiday Inn, 12 or 17 floors or something. Next door, there's an even hotel, which is pretty nice. Uh, two blocks down, there's some other really opulent looking hotel. It doesn't have a name. And two blocks further down is a Hilton hotel. You know, at five minutes walk from the temple. And these new condos, apartments starting at a million dollars and, you know, for a studio and all around the temple like that. Radha Govinda attracted all these people. 
So that's so. I, I, from what I understood, actually, Brooklyn Temple is probably among the few ISKCON temples, which are like large temples and are also in the mainstream of the city. Maybe the LA, yeah. temple, LA temple is one, but LA temple is more like distributed. We have one temple structure and then we have other places. But Brooklyn is a whole building. We don't have many, yeah. many, many places like that. Manor is out of the city in London. Even the temples in Sydney or Melbourne. Melbourne is not very big. Sydney is also, it's, it's not that big. I don't think any other place we have that big temples in the mainstream of the me- metropolis in outside India. Yeah. But anyway, Brooklyn is there and it's coming up from the, you know, trouble. Yes, and that is a whole different subject. Maybe we could discuss but, that. But no, there's very not every day, a lot of the book distribution. The restaurant is growing every day. Uh, people are coming for other classes. And okay. And uh, when we talk about about uh, so Japan, it, it's from my, what I understand, it's officially a secular country. So Hinduism is also one of the official recognized religions over there. Or, or do we present ourselves as Hindus, or do we just say we are presenting yoga philosophy, or how do we present broadly position ourselves there? I think now you know the devotees are preaching to the Japanese. They stress more on yoga philosophy. I mean, myself, even when I, I used to distribute a lot of books there, I always said Indo no Tetsugaku, no, it's just Indian philosophy. And a lot of people like that. And then you know they're like for real, you know. So uh, mm-hmm. I stressed on philosophy as knowledge of this, of the soul. And that's what I said to people, even on the street. And I think that's how they're preaching because they're really trying to teach Bhagavad Gita and talking to people a lot. It used to be very quick sales. You know, people like to give a donation quick and sometimes very big donations. Now it's not like that, but there's a lot of people that want to talk for a long time and want an association and you have questions. So that you know, is going on because these new devotees, they're not in the ashram, they're not, they're independently sustaining their lives and they just want to preach. They want to share what they got. Exactly how they share it, I haven't heard how they talk to people, okay. but it's working. It's definitely working. And one girl's a yoga teacher and she got all her students and then she just called up other yoga schools all over the country and told them they should buy Bhagavad Gita and selling like 20 or 30 at a time. Just because she thought it was, yeah. And, uh, so okay. But, but Japan, if I go back to that, Japan is officially secular country. So there is no hostility to Krishna consciousness or, is, uh, or Hinduism. Also no, not, at, not at all. The, when the Americans, uh, after the war, they wrote the constitution. So they it's complete freedom of religion. Oh, um, okay. But they the Japanese, you know, they like the communists, they said no religion makes people want religion, right? The Japanese religion is fine, you can do whatever you want if you can't succeed in the material world. But now it's different. Somehow or other, the people are much different. And they want, it's not religion. No, we not, I don't think anybody's promoting religion. They're promoting lifestyle and, you know, happy, you know, bliss and all the things, you know. That, okay. They're not talking religion, religion, religion. Mm. So, but like when I first came, the Japanese devotees were there told me Japanese hate religion. And I went out distributing, we had a magazine and they, did, they made it trying to not look like a religion, look like some mundane thing. But it had articles about, you know, chanting. And, but I found many people ask me, what, what religion is this? So I just say this is the original religion, it's the oldest religion. 
And that's how I developed my approach to people. I just say, this is the oldest philosophy, this is the oldest religion, and people would be interested. And oh. Buddha is an incarnation of Krishna. They're not fanatic Buddhists there at all. Oh, okay. The Buddhist temples for funerals, more or less, <laughs> and some ceremonies, and then they have for marriage, they have the Shinto, Japanese Hinduism, and a lot of people, for they now they get married in a Christian marriage or something. But it's all just a show. Very few people oh. really seriously practice anything. Mm. But they can appreciate. So anyway, that now it's just they're going out. They like the philosophy. They want to know. They want to know about the soul. So you made an interesting point that Japanese constitution was written by Americans. So how much is... Uh, the how much is the overall atmosphere there similar to the West? You were from America, so overall you know about America. Well, they tried to copy, you know, so they dress is the same, you know, like everywhere in the world now. Externally, everything's the same. Uh, okay, but still, everybody's, people... everybody's Hollywood, you know, everywhere in the world. Uh, and American television and all that. So rock and roll, you know. So the the original culture, they're still there in, in many ways. What I, a little prejudiced, but you see they kind of preserve the unpleasant parts of their fanatic parts of their culture and they leave aside all the good parts. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you're talking about the Japanese Buddhist culture or the Japanese? Uh, just the general culture, which is, of course, comes from Buddhism. But still, at least they take off their shoes when they go in the house and they're respectful and they don't like to get in fights and everything, you know. But sometimes in, inside they're really fighting, but they hide it. It's too crowded there. They can't, like, they have to tolerate, you know. Oh, okay. But, you know, it's at Manusya Nam Sasvishu. It's not everybody anywhere, but like I said, more and more they are. Yoga schools are everywhere, you know. And now it's like, same thing, America. Every, every gym, you know, for working out, they have a yoga section and, you know, physical fitness of different kinds. And then there's a, I don't know all of them, but Sai Baba was really big in Japan for a while. Um, so, yeah, so that I don't think it, people, but it made people think about India. Even the Japanese government sent people to India to find out why they're joining, why Japanese are joining Sai Baba. <laughs> okay. So it's a, uh... you know, these different things come and go. Hmm. And Hare Krishna is never as big as these other ones. But more and more, because those books are out there and it's just everywhere. The books are having an effect. Many people read them, but we never meet them. They're all over the country. You know. Okay. That's So overall... You feel quite optimistic about the growth prospects for Krishna consciousness in in uh, in Japan as of now. The way you have seen things over the last well, after I years. heard these Buddhist reports just yesterday, uh, <laughs> yes, very much. Uh, oh, wonderful! I mean, I was really uh, kind of carrying on, just you know, be out of duty or something for many years. And uh, not results weren't coming, visible, visible results weren't coming. But like I said, this is in the last few years, five years maybe, one by one, some Japanese get initiated and they want to share it with other Japanese. And now it's just, they're really on fire. So, and it's not just that they're trying to distribute books and get on the newsletter, they don't even care about that. 
they're just trying to do it, you know, to please their guru or whatever. So then, you know, I have a help. Banu Maharaj comes there, Vaisheshika, Satchadev. So everybody's doing more and more to inspire people from different angles. That's wonderful. Then can we shift to China now? Because China is yeah. a whole different universe. So Yeah, no, China. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was involved. Sorry. Yeah, you can you can start with. I don't think Prabhupada ever visited China directly, isn't it? No. He did visit Japan a few times. This is the 50th anniversary of his first visit to Japan. Okay. And so Prabhupada. Did, the, so, sorry. Go ahead, go. Please go. He ahead. went three times. Okay. So uh, that's remarkable. Three times is significant. So then China, he, he didn't visit because of the hostilities between the two countries. Legally, it was not possible for a Hindu preacher. It wasn't very difficult for anyone to visit China in those days. Anyone. Oh, okay. But Japan, he went to negotiate with China Pond. Yes, that is a well-known meeting about the stack of oh, cards and visiting cards. The amazing thing is that they gave him credit. And the, the policy was if you buy from Japan, you have to pay cash in advance. If you sell to them, you have to give them credit. But they gave Prabhupada credit. Now, I heard different versions. One was that they really saw that Prabhupada was a, they, saintly and they really respected him. Another was that they, they somehow could see that he was going to sell a lot of books. So they wanted his business. <laughs> so they... They were printing a million back to Godhead back in those days. Million? Yeah, a million every month. That, that was the main book at the time. And then they did the TLC. But then when the Krishna book came, and that's what really set off big book distribution in the world, in America and in the rest of the world. And they printed that. And they printed the uh, first canto, second canto, and the first volume of the third canto. Huge. Uh, we, when they came, it was three, two shipping containers, oh, big containers. But this first big order. And that's when the devotees went really wild in America for book distribution. So Japan got a lot of credit. They had super high quality. And at that time, because of the Money exchange is very cheap. Then somehow the money changing values change and the BBT had to switch over to the printing in America. Now they print in China and India. Oh, okay. Looking for the prices, you know. That's so they did a big contribution. And okay. Guru Kripa's party, bless their souls, they were very you know, heavy, but they gave a huge amount of money to Prabhupada so that Vrindavan could be built in Juhu also and Mayapur to some extent. Japanese got a lot of punya for that. They didn't really know what they were doing, but they were very generous then to give donations. That's amazing. So yeah. uh, now... Prabhupada, step by step, Krishna helped him. So, two points here. Maybe, maybe before we go to China, then since we brought Dynapon, so are we still, is the company still alive and are we still working with them? Because you mentioned earlier that uh, getting, getting books printed is it's now still a big company, but it's too expensive to print in Japan. Okay. And uh, so, do, does BBT itself print its own books in? in Japan now or do we work with some publisher or some printer they print in China oh in China and get it okay and when uh, I was there I printed the first Bhagavad Gita I did in Japan we had a friend there got us a good deal but uh, then China India mostly China so the Hong Kong BBT much cheaper and the, the recent Bhagavad Gita was printed in China Okay. 
And Maharaj, uh, do you also encourage the printing of some bridge books or which books do you primarily distribute? And uh, do you feel there are need for some other books also which can make Krishna consciousness more accessible to people? Yeah, one girl is printing one now. She's a Russian and she's a disciple of Chaitanya Chandracharan. Okay. And he's a super bridge preacher. So it's one book called Karma. She got translated and is getting it ready to print. Oh. We need everything. Coming Back was very, very popular then. And Oh, okay. But right now, Bhagavad Gita is just going like mad, you know, but the devotees want more books also. So we need we need the regular books. We don't have them so much. I'm running out. We don't have Isha Panishad. We don't have... We have Leela Amrita. SSR was very popular, but that's also out of print. So something has to be done. I'm a little helpless on that. It's another story. But... Mm. people are getting hungry for it. They just, they actually want the books. Like I said previously, it was, they would give donations and take the book. And, but obviously some people were reading them. Now it's, they want the book. <laughs> it's not so easy to just get donations, you know, because they had a lot of economic difficulties. But a lot of people want the book. Of course, they still spend money wildly for sense gratification. It's like everywhere. Hmm. But it's just a big change. And now that I see all these young devotees really enthusiastic about everything, they love kirtan, they love prasadam, they love to study. They, they come to so many classes every week online and practicing all the instruments. It's hmm. a big thing. That's fascinating. So and the ukulele kirtan. <laughs> yeah, the girls have to, they all carry every one of them has a ukulele on their back. <laughs> so they're so going on and on. What did you say? Ukulele? Ukulele. ukulele. What is that? It's that little tiny like guitar four string instrument. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. It's, it's very attractive and it doesn't scare people. But you can take it anywhere. And so one girl started that and they all picked up on it. It's very easy to learn. Oh, okay. Fascinating. So you are quite open to having, say, non-traditional instruments in the kirtan also? As well, the kirtan, yeah, the instruments, that's about the only one. Uh, sometimes they do a show in a club and they haven't been able to do that now because of COVID, but it was getting very popular. And then they have guitar and, you know, everything, Madunga though, harmonium, drums. But it's very simple. It's very straight. Hare Krishna only. You know? Oh, okay. The ukulele just really works good because they can just have it with them anywhere. And uh, people are just not intimidated by it. It can get really close to people. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and that's the thing because American wrote, the, there's no restriction on you know, where you can go and chant. You can chant on any street corner, anywhere you want. And there's no law against it. As long as you keep moving, because the police said, you know, anytime a, a group of people crowd together, they make you move. You get oh. four or five people watching for five minutes. The police will just pop up out of the ground and say, you have to move. But they never stop it. They just say you have to move. Okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. Mm -mm. So now... And my, the Beatles were very popular there. My, you know, George Harrison was really popular. My Sweet yes. Lord was a hit there. You know top 10 back in the day. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. So overall, it seems that if I understand that there are four broad ways in which so the, the Kirtan is one, Yoga is another, book distribution is third, and then 
so, some kind of education as educational courses, people, a study groups. Yeah. These are the four Vedic broad ways in which things seem to be growing. Mostly Bhagavad Gita classes. I'm giving online, you know, Bhagavatam classes. Okay. And we only have one volume of the first canto, so I'm kind of going over it with a fine tooth comb <laughs> with them to get them oh. reading it. And hopefully they will, you know, want to translate and get more books. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Yeah. And Prasadam, of course. Yes. Prasadam is very important everywhere. Okay, so when we do prasadam, do we have Indian cuisine or do we make Japanese cuisine or a mix of both or what, what do we do? It's Hare Krishna. Fusion. <laughs> what does that mean? It's Hare Krishna fusion, you know, it's some in, kind of Indian, but not exactly. <laughs> you know. Okay. So you mentioned also... for Japanese, you know, okay. they don't like hot chilies and stuff and oil. So that's interesting. So oh, you also mentioned that you're saying Indian Indian food and Indian restaurants are also popular in Japan. In is a genre of food itself. There's so many Indian restaurants. Oh, and these are visited by non-Indians. By local Japanese yeah, people. By Indians, a lot of them are, are Nepalis, but Indian restaurants, there's many, many, but there's only one or two that are vegetarian. Okay. No, because I'm, I'm asking you, like Chinese food has become a whole genre in itself, Chinese cuisine or Italian cuisine. I don't know if Indian food has become that influential a, a not, genre not outside in, India. Not in the same way. Not in the same way, yes. That's true. But they come to the Indian restaurants, but, you know, they like the spicy chicken or something. It's not, vegetarian Indian food is not known at all. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, just since you brought up vegetarianism, how much is veget like veganism is very big in, in the West. Uh, how much is that uh, part of the contemporary Japanese cultural scene scenario? Yeah, uh, I think a big majority of the vegetarians are vegans. Now, okay. the young people. But is vegan also a significant demographic? There are a uh, lot of good number of people who are becoming vegan there also. It's not really, really big, but it is growing. Okay. And, you know, it was Japanese vegetarian that the first vegetarians in America were the brown rice people, you know, and it's coming from Japan. Sorry, what? Brown rice people? Yeah, in Japan, it's called Gemai Shokai. It's kind of like a religion, the brown rice, oh. unhauled rice, and no dairy and all these kind of things. And vegetables. That's interesting. Okay. But the Japanese picked up on the American and McDonald's is the number one restaurant. Oh, okay. KFC is the number two. <laughs> so, but it's changing to some extent. More and more vegetarian restaurants, like the devotees made one and people were coming from very far away but then more and more vegetarian restaurants opened and then there's not so many coming anymore. Oh, okay. But still we have, a, the devotees have one or two that are still doing good. Osaka, we have one. Mm -hmm. She was, a, she had the Indian restaurant already. She became a devotee, so she became a vegetarian. Oh, okay. With the economy, the, Veg the restaurant business is way down in Japan. So, because of the pandemic or in general? No, before even they had the economic. Before also, okay. And then oh. the pandemic even more because they, many places are closed. Yes, that is true. Mm. But they oh. love prasadam and cooking classes are very popular. They want to know vegetarian cooking. Someone were doing online vegetarian cooking. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to encourage them to do something, you know, 
to everybody to get online, get on, open up to Facebook and read the Bible, get to do something, you know. So they're doing that. Mm, they, they have babies, they can't really go out so much, but they do things like that. All right, so it's a fascinating place. Yes, my much. So it's like, you know, up and down, so it was down for a long time, but it came back up. Oh, okay. I give the example, like you see on the television, like somebody's in the hospital and the thing is going like this, you know. So that means they're alive. You know, if it flatlines, it's dead. So even if you're going down, at least you're still alive, you know, and you're going to have to come up. Right. So mm -hmm. this is how the machine goes everywhere. Yeah, that is true. So overall, you feel that uh, there are many avenues, and your your overall mood is that let devotees start doing whatever they can, and then we will see what works, and that can be done. Praise them, praise them, encourage them to do more. Tell everybody else about what they're doing. You know, try to you know, enliven everybody. Hmm. So that's a wonderful. So maybe we can shift to China now. And uh, yeah. Okay. So how much time do you have? Because we will probably need at least half, half an hour to an hour for to discuss about China. You can do it another I, time if you feel. I have another about an hour. Okay. So, so China. I was a little bit involved in the very beginning. Okay, sorry, sorry, Manu, to, sorry to interrupt you. Before, before we move ahead, this one question about Japan. So currently, how many centers do we have? How many devotees do we have? And just some some overall idea about the uh, of the situation in Japan in, before we conclude. Tokyo, we had the big temple, radical okay. Vinda which is becoming popular. And, but like I said, there's no ashram there really. There's a few people live there. Okay. Jaris. But then we have these devotees preaching in their houses. And they're really preaching centers that people come over their house all the time. They're, they're very wide open, which is not normal Japanese culture. Normally people don't go to each other's house. <laughs> but somehow they opened up like that and they really like it. And I don't know how many, I know two main ones, but then these yoga schools also because they're having regular classes in the yoga schools or regular kirtans. And some of them start their own independent programs in their yoga schools. So I'm not sure how many exactly. Number of devotees is nothing spectacular. There's probably been about 90 or so initiated in all these years, but it's increased. We're getting steadily, steadily more people getting initiated. Okay. And do we have like smaller centers or satellite? India, we have the concept of satellite centers. It not be a full, full. Not officially. Not officially. In Osaka, we have one, but due to the you know, it's family and the jobs they have, they can't have like regular programs every once a week or every two weeks or something. But but again, some of the devotees are yoga teachers and they have uh, a lot of students and they, they make a lot of kirtan programs and distribute a lot of books and they cultivate people in different ways. The one that has a yoga school, she's also an astrologer, but she preaches, she's a big preacher. So, okay. and, Fu and uh, Fukuoka a little bit, Okinawa, uh, one girl there is really fired up and, and she gets a lot of people for her ukulele kirtans and lessons. She's a super musician. She's actually famous. So she makes programs and gets everybody chanting and gets all the musicians together. So like that is going on. It's, it's got a long way to go to spread everywhere, but people know about it a little bit everywhere. 
That's wonderful. So roughly, do you have any estimate of how many devotees? Actually, it's a little difficult to count because how do we define a devotee? But in terms of either attendance to programs or initiation or broad connection. Well, they just had the John Moss to me. Those kind of programs, a lot of people come. But, uh, and nowadays, a lot like, well, for Prabhupada's appearance, there's almost all Japanese. They, they had a quite big crowd. And we have a lot of Russian young people that are devotees <laughs> that are there. Oh. Some of them are already initiated, some are getting initiated. Uh, many of them are coming from Chaitanya Chandra Charan in his oh, online okay. preaching. So does he preach in Japanese or he preaches in... No, he's preaching in Russian. But he has, you know, Russians are everywhere. So he has big following everywhere. Makes a lot of devotees. Oh, okay. And it's bridge preaching. Some people accuse him of not being straightforward, but... He's very straightforward and a really brilliant preacher, but he just knows how to bring people in. He's totally charming. And the Russians are very good at interfacing with the Japanese. They get along really good. Okay. So there is not, so in the, in the Second World War, there's hostility between Japan and China. Now it is not so much there, is it? They are, they're good no. No, it's not anymore. China is begging Japanese tourists to come. Japan is begging Chinese tourists to come. Japanese uh, stores and stuff are part-time workers. They prefer Chinese Chinese students. They say they work much better. You know, the Japanese have got a little spoiled by all the success and the money. They don't have that, you know, really hardworking ethic anymore. So there's always campaigns to bring more. There's lots of Chinese tourists. I don't know now with the COVID and everything, but there was so many Chinese tourists coming to Japan, so many Japanese going to China. But in China, the devotees are all Chinese. Oh, yes. So, uh, so in, now we move on to China. It seems that there are multiple little challenges. One, of course, is that China is officially an atheistic country. And then the relationship between India and China also not the best. So how much? Now it's, or it's only, that is a, only a recent phenomenon in the last few years? Yeah, it's, uh, but historically, you know, Chinese who studied, they know that their whole culture came from India. Mm. Like one devotee is an academic and he teaches Chinese culture in the Confucius University or something. And he takes tour groups of Jap Chinese businessmen to India to show them how it came from India. Oh, and, they do, and people, they don't object to that. No, they like it. The government, the government is encouraging Chinese culture. But then if we show that Chinese culture is coming from India, doesn't that affect their nationalistic pride on their search for nationalistic identity? I, I don't know. It's hard to know exactly. Okay. You know, because this conflict, you know, Prabhupada mentioned in, in the first canto how now there's border trouble with China and India and now that's come back again it's, it's crazy but as far as preaching there Tamal Krishnaraj went and it was all in Hong Kong in the beginning and not making any devotees I used to visit there so I, I was involved in getting the first Chinese person to join oh. and then gradually got into China. And I didn't go for a long time because I was caught up in a lot, not only the Asia, but I always go into Israel and Greece and, and West Africa, which is a whole nother world if you want to know about that. But um, So Maharaj, when you went in China, I presume you 
you in china you cannot go as a monk as a especially as a hindu monk so you no we no we go dressed in, in ordinary clothes okay and uh, you have a american passport so that makes it easier or tougher or how does it work no problem visas are easy oh okay they give you 10 year visas now but now the border is closed but it was 10 oh, year 10 visa. years visa okay that's quite yeah that's quite reciprocating in america and china oh okay and uh, in china because we don't have temples so or at least uh, we so what is the official position is hinduism banned or is it uh, that you cannot have public displays of hindu religion I, it's or very hard to know you know we don't they the devotees do not present themselves as hindus oh okay the yoga culture or something officially hindu is not a recognized religion but with the business ties between india and china there are a good number of in- indians there also so do they practice their religion privately like in the middle east or what do they do no, they, they can do it yeah just like in the middle east okay and uh, overall and then the bodies they just uh, they are japanese are full of anxieties and tension and many things with the chinese they look the same kind of but they're very relaxed they love to get together in big groups and party kind of thing dance in the streets and everything so somehow or other when they got started and you know there's a lot of devotees there and they got all the bhagavatam translated and every book you can think of practically chaitanya charitamrita they haven't finished yet but you know devotees just take it on their own and they have mahabharat and they have radhana swami's book and then you know and their bbt has done the whole bhagavatam gotten it legal with the government so mm, okay that's interesting so mm, then here the book everything like- is everything is at home you know except at yoga schools and it's kirtan yoga which is okay. oh okay <laughs> that's interesting so homes means we have chinese people homes or indians home or whatever works out chinese there's not that many indians uh, oh okay chinese apartment some places they have an apartment they use just for meetings okay and, and they don't have once in a while they get a little trouble from somebody but it so far no big thing we don't talk about it so much but okay all the devotees are friendly with the local government and stuff and they don't make any trouble they're all good citizens so i mean i, I don't want to create any trouble so maybe you can you can broadly discuss what we can discuss uh, over there so uh, from what yeah, i would just say that you know it's it's the same everywhere and in hong kong i started out by having yoga classes that ended up with meditation you know mantra meditation and then they picked out people that were interested and china when they first came you know different different lot of older ladies joined very serious practitioners maybe they were buddhist serious buddhist or something some students and they're just finding their, their own way you know to now i don't know exactly cuz we haven't been able to go there for a long time but i have contact with a lot of them I have two classes a week and the Friday morning ones about 180 to devotees online. Oh okay. I mean they join yeah. for one class or different classes at different times. Well they have a lot of classes you know 
a lot of different devotees giving classes and all the foreign preachers, different days, different times. And they're all like that, they, you know. I have another one that's a Tuesday night. That ends up about 120. Some of them are coming after some other class. They come, but the Friday morning Bhagavad Gita is uh, about 180, something like that. Hmm. Maybe some of the others that have been there longer, they have even maybe 250 or so. So, you know, that's one way. The Zoom boom has been, you know, that's one advantage of the COVID. I got everybody online and we can get together much easier than having to go somewhere. But mm. Yes, Maharaj. So this is so this is primarily through the yoga medium or in China, how how do we reach I, I don't know exactly. I just know the yoga one is big. Okay. And like for instance, I have one disciple, she's quite a well known yoga teacher. And uh, she very brilliant organizer. Mm. She made a tour once with myself and Lokana Swami. Okay, I remember Mahaya Lokanath Maharaj had uh, I saw, Maharaj had told me about he had come on my podcast also. So he had also before that we had talked about this. He had been quite happy she printed, also doing kirtans at that time. She printed three thousand Bhagavad Gita for that on her own. Mm. And we went to many cities and she got big crowds, you know, with her students have their own yoga schools and stuff. And people paid and they get a Bhagavad Gita, they get kirtan, they get a Bhagavad Gita class, prasana, little prasana. So she's still doing things like that. And I think mm. many of them. Done. And they're finding other ways, businessmen, just cooking, one devotee is really big with his cooking classes, but it, you know, it's so much philosophy. He gives it the same time. People really like it. Oh, okay. And you know, uh, so, but even in the in private, you can do kirtans also. Is it like that? Yeah, they do kirtan. Oh. Not outside so much. Sometimes devotees go in the park and chant. Nobody, you know, they don't promote themselves as a religion. Okay. So even kirtans are possible. That's interesting. So. Kirtan yoga. <laughs> no, kirtan means public kirtans are also allowed. They do it not very much, but some, some devotees do it different places. Okay. And. Uh, is China also, it's a large country. So is it also internally, culturally quite diverse in terms of people? I think so. I think so. Okay. So when you travel, is it to the main cities or you go to various places also? Many different places. Uh, you know, there's okay. so many big cities in China. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, they're not big compared to the biggest cities in China, but compared to the other countries, they're really big cities. Yeah. I mean, a million people is not a big city in China. <laughs> That's true. So actually, a million people in India is also not a very big city. We have huge, but Mumbai has more than a crore population. So, so it's the same thing. It, it just they, There's a lot of online stuff going on. So that was primarily started during the pandemic? No, before even. Many, many devotees preach online and they make an online shop with Indian things and books and they have yoga books and every, all kinds of books along with Prabhupada's books. And... Okay. So yoga books are specifically written for yoga audiences? Uh, from a yoga perspective? Yeah, just other yoga books, not our books. You know. Although there's some devotees that have written yoga books. A few of them are actually big, famous yoga teachers. And they organize big, at least they did, you know, big festivals of yoga with a lot of kirtan and with philosophy. And... 
That's amazing. So I don't, I've not been in on a, you know, amongst the devotees at the moment. <clears throat> They're organizing very nicely so many different uh, groups and so many different aspects and assign it so they can really seriously study and everything. And they have so many devotees. Oh, okay. And, uh, not compared to India, but yeah, of course, yeah. So, so they it, can it's, also. It's different in Japan because they're all Chinese. When I first came to Japan, we had only Japanese devotees, and when all the Indians start coming, it it's, uh, it's a whole other world, you know, to bring oh, okay. it all together. The Nirvitashas and the Shunyavadis have to come together, you know. But that's also breaking down by Kirtan. Everybody's getting used to the fact that you're not the body, mm -hmm. you know. And that's our biggest problem that we identify with the body. It's a challenge. So as far as myself, I went to Thailand also. And Okay, so just coming back to China. So is it is it just that we have to do it discreetly, or is there like fear of detection and persecution from what, say, for no. example, what we read about say Krishna consciousness in Soviet Russia, the devotees were actively under threat of being persecuted. Is it like that, or no, no. is it like middle no, East, devotees is not never persecuted? Sorry, devotees, they never had any problem like that. Oh, okay. So in some ways, it is like the Middle East. As long as we we keep to something like, something follow like their that. rules, they don't really have trouble don't with us. You the government, you just nice people, you know, they're all good citizens. And hmm. they, they might know, you know, about them, but they see they're nice people and I guess it just can go on, you know. Okay. And uh, so when they when people are attracted to say yoga or kirtan, eventually, do they also, in we're talking China, do they also take up chanting and serious bhakti practices? Well, it's a small percentage like okay. everywhere else. Yeah, of course. I think that's everywhere. It's, it's like in Bombay, Baladev Prabhu said when they go to a university, they might start out with 200 students. Yes. And at first, they can't really preach very much or the university won't like it. So they just joke and talk casually and have a little kirtan. Gradually, they cultivate some. And he said, after two years, maybe they get two devotees. If they have it all, you know, Hurts not like everybody, everybody's good, but some do. Same thing in Japan. Some take it up seriously. In different different degrees. Some just like to have the devotees come and chant in their yoga school, but personally they're not practicing or they like other gurus to come also. You know, they they like everybody. But you know, they're reading our Bhagavad Gita, so we just try to keep going like that. It's like a, whatever way you can reach people, like everywhere. Hmm. And a lot of the devotees were practicing Buddhism of some kind. There's different kinds of Buddhism, but one is called Pure Land Buddhism. They have that in Japan also, where you go to the land of Buddha and you be with Buddha. And they're vegetarian for the most part and quite personal. So a lot of them, when they contact Bhagavad Gita and more philosophy, they really like it. Okay, so so Bhagavad Gita itself is not a problem. It is uh, so we can distribute Bhagavad Gita also in through our programs. You said that that Mataji had printed several uh, hundred copies of the Bhagavad Gita. Thousand, three thousand. Okay, <laughs> so distributing no, the Gita is also at, not a problem. At that time, no, in the programs, it's a yoga program, and Bhagavad Gita is a yoga book. And... Oh, okay. 
You know, they're just, they're very smart people. They just know how to do it. I don't know exactly, you know, what they're thinking, of it, but so far, I just, you know, they, a little, you, you got to keep cool, you know, you can make a big show. But like I said, everywhere, even in America, we need to do that. In India, you know, the 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 home programs of Bhakti Vriksha, the the intimate programs of a few people getting together, this is very, it's really important if you want to cultivate people. So, from from both your focus and what you mentioned in China as well as in, in Japan earlier, it seems ultimately it's the personal connections that will help people to grow, whatever be the initial right. pathways, whether it is yoga yeah. or kirtan or whatever. It's a personal thing that ultimately does it. Even say in India, if somebody comes to the temple because they're naturally pious, attracted to temples, but unless somebody becomes friends with them, they're not going to become devotees. Okay. The Christians in America, they have statistics on everything, you know, and they say that people will come to a religion and join maybe for so many reasons. But they stay because they make friends. Okay. We have to learn to be friends with people. And I think this is... Uh, Everywhere. Yeah. And Prabhupada also, sometimes we may emphasize that Prabhupada was like, philosophically penetrating and Prabhupada was strong and uncompromising. And those are all true. But Prabhupada attracted the hearts of his disciples. And that was through the personal connections. And I think that's what in the early moment, early years of our movement, when we we're expanding, that's what devotees were doing with new people, also quite vibrantly. Yeah, like if you hear, we read, the, see these memories of devotees who met Prabhupada a little bit closely. Nobody was saying, "Oh, he knew so much; he had so much knowledge." They said he had so much love; he was so kind. That's what attracted them. And the devotees were trying to be like that. And as long as we try to be like that, we're going to get more and more. Mm, that's remarkable. So, so For me, I've been trying to stress that. And a few of these older devotees in Japan, they're my disciples. In the last years, they gradually, gradually uh, did that. Come to my house, chant Hare Krishna, learn to cook learn the harmonium, you know, and then they get more and more coming. And oh, okay. Then those people like to go to the temple, of course, and, you know, they like to see the deities and the beautiful decorations and everything, and that also helps them. But to make them real devotees, we need a personal okay. association. So I think this is... Uh... This is, I would say this is a critical point that there may be specific cultural challenges, uh, specific situational dynamics, but beyond it all, if we can have this, what Rupa Goswami talks about, the Shadvidam Priti Lakshanam, the six-fold exchanges. I never cared about that. He just loved everybody because it's an important person for Krishna and that attracted everybody. So that's what I said, like our own prejudices. We don't see that so much. We see the body we see that things that aren't even with our own idea, which is not even true. We think we know what someone's thinking, but especially when you have the language barriers. So Maharaj, you've made this very striking statement, Prabhupada never saw that, but we also see Prabhupada often makes strong statements about particular demographics, whether it will be, we, we need not go into the specific quotes, but say people of a particular gender or a particular uh, skin color, or there are some quotes of Prabhupada which seem to be quite strong and they can be very controversial in today's world. So, yeah, that's so, another no, seminar. So, but, but, so, what you are saying is that the, that was not the, that was never prominent in people's minds when they were approaching Prabhupada. Or, no way. Yeah. I mean, oh, so okay, interesting. I don't know if you've seen a, you know, Krishna Nandini. She was a huge preacher in the Grihasta yes, vision yes. team. Yes, yes. 
Yeah. And, and have you ever heard her tell her story about how that family met Prabhupada? Sorry, which one are you? They're black, you know, so-called black. I mean the right article. There's no black people. There's only dark skin, you know. Okay. And it's not the people. There's no white people. It's all the skin color only. And we're too much absorbed in skin color. It's uh, difficult to overcome. But anyway, her mother, they were very, very religious. And they had been going to different Christian and not being satisfied. And the mother, I don't know, somehow she was writing to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was writing back. She gave herself a spiritual name and Prabhupada used it in dealing with her. Then the temple president where they were in Cleveland said they couldn't stay at the temple. So they just packed their car up with about six or seven people and drove and drove and drove without knowing where they're going. And they got to Dallas. And okay. the temple president said, you can't stay here, you know. This, and they begged him. They said, "We, you know, we have no place. Left. And so he said, okay, one night. This is a family of about six or seven colored people in Dallas, Texas. So then they found out Prabhupada was coming the next day. They had no idea. They thought Prabhupada was in India. So they got really excited. So the next day, the mother went and demanded, I want to see Prabhupada. And they were trying to keep her away, you know, like they tried to keep everybody away in those days. Prabhupada found out. He said, no, he knew her. He knew her by name. And he said, what do you want? And she said, I want to get, you know, my family initiated. And Prabhupada initiated five of them right on the spot. Really? This is what they are? Testing, you know. We don't know them. Nobody knows them. Prabhupada said, no. Gave them all initiation. And they all still devotees. And Krishna Nandini has 10 kids who are all devotees. And... Oh, I didn't know that story. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. You can look it up on the internet. <laughs> she tells it. So, so what you are saying by this is that uh, that Prabhupada focused on the... He might have said things, you know, okay. I calculate a lot of the things he said is because people feel that way. Like he said, even the black Africans are becoming devotees. But he was not against, he liked, he loved the Africans to become devotees. But he would say that because people have this idea that they're so uncivilized. So he was just trying to show how powerful the process is. Even the Chinese, even people, they can't believe it, you know. People have so much prejudice. So he was saying things and, but, you know, you can't find any group of race or where everybody's the same, you know, there's good and bad people everywhere. All right, so. That's amazing. So this, so you, so if you. And Prabhupada was like that everywhere. He just. And he wanted the local people. And so, so if so when I, he so preached to people, he didn't. He didn't think in America these hippies and they're all stoned and they've been having illicit sex and how can they be devotees? He just said, "This is the spirit soul that wanted to hear about Krishna," and he got right through to the soul immediately. So, so what you are saying is that that Prabhupada focused on. So if you want to continue Prabhupada's legacy or continue Prabhupada's mission, more than the letter of more than the literal letter of whatever he has said, we need to have that spirit of compassion and connection. That is love, what we, love. kindness, and and the karmis are coming up with. You know, I saw on the internet some doctor was listing ten essential books your children should read. And the titles of about seven of them, at least, was kindness, all about kindness and how you should be kind. You know, that's not like the stories I, when I was a kid, we got violent stories, you know, Hansel and Gretel and stuff, that killed a witch and the changing. And I think it's all because of Prabhupada's influence that so many people are reading Bhagavad Gita everywhere. And it, they even unconsciously, but they're being affected by it. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. They won't so, know, you know, but everybody believes in reincarnation. 
you know, it's all because of Prabhupada. Oh. So other places, you know, Thailand, for instance, is my zone. Yes. And so the Thai people are very much Buddhist. We are Buddhist, but they don't practice. But okay. they very much identify and they like to go to the temples. They give a lot of the money and they all eat meat. The monks eat meat. Oh, okay. So, but, but Thailand is often uh, perceived more as a tourist destination with, uh, maybe this is again a prejudice that I have. Uh, it's, it's made, but it's like a tourist destination with a lot of sensuality and other things although that is there, but still there is also some religion over there. Is there or some spiritual inclination? Well, there's so many Buddhist temples. And of course, they're one of the main tourist attractions. The daytime they go to the temples. Okay. Nighttime they go to the clubs. <laughs> but uh, the people are, they pray a lot. They love to pray to the Buddhist temples and even the Hindu Durga temple or something, they love to come and offer incense and pray. Oh, even in Hindu they, Durga temples? They there's Hindu temples, yeah. Oh, so you're saying people means the Buddhist people or in general people will come to the temples? Everybody. Everybody, okay. My people love it. There's one in Bangkok, the Durga temple. And of course, they have all the other, even Krishna along the side. But it's always packed up, busy with people praying, offering incense. So overall, are these temples built by Hindu immigrants, who, Indian immigrants who went there recently? Yeah, they were built a long time ago. Okay. There's not very many. But Thai people like to come and pray any kind of gods. Oh, okay. So when I went there, there was no Thai devotees. There was one. And he joined in America and his sister joined with him, two sisters. And then he... He was such a good devotee, they didn't want him to leave Chicago. But finally, he came back to Thailand. And I just went there. I stayed with him. We went on Harinam, just two or three of us. And I convinced him to translate. He dedicated his life for translating Ram Lakshman. And uh, he's just like a genius, you know, uh, and humble at the same time, a very special person. He, he he got his acupuncture degree in like record time, and he's a graduate engineer and, you know, everything. But so he just translated, and we have a lot of books now, and gradually, gradually tied about it. But then many, many Nepalis came into Thailand from running away from uh, Burma. And oh. they're all devotees. A lot of them are already devotees. And then we had this, <clears throat> so many of them. And time went on. They have children who grew up in Thailand, speak Thai, went to school. And they're very good at preaching and Thai people. So now Thai people are coming much more. And things oh, are growing. Okay. That's so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just, you know, I was at first, I said, Ram, do you really want all these Nepali people? Because they were coming to all the Harinam, and it became all Nepalis, you know. But the Thai were just going by and all friendly, but very unlikely to get serious. But now, because a lot of devotees are in different ways, one family, the husband and wife are both teachers at the university, and they have a lot of contact with Thai people. And they're Nepali, but they speak Thai. And, you know, just so gradually, gradually, these Thai young people, they can preach to the Thai people no problem whatsoever. And they can communicate and relate to them really good. So I'm getting more and more Thai people. Again, there's no restriction, no legal problems or anything there. Okay. So, you know, they just say I'm Buddhist, but they're not really. That's interesting. And overall, see, now there, are, there may be several countries and I'm not sure um, how much we could discuss now. 
but overall mm, how how much do you feel that uh, uh, so overall the receptivity toward krishna consciousness in these places is it strongly negatively or positively impacted by uh, by that coming to people through iskon or it doesn't make much difference uh they don't know what it is kan is you know oh, we okay. have to teach them so so it is basically they just accept it for what it is and if they find, so there yeah. also it is coming through yoga or not so much through yoga here no not, not well now a few yoga teachers are joining but it was just to kirtan and books in in on one on one preaching in thailand oh, okay but then in the palis made a temple there was always a small temple but not much happening in different different personalities but then they made a temple and but at first in thai people were coming because they just like gods you know they like to worship but not enough to what he spoke thai to cultivate them but now these kids that grew up there they're thai citizens they're but they're from the pali background but their language is thai their main language and they're preaching really nicely so i'm getting somewhere Okay because we want to get to local people you know and then when you get the indians come they naturally come to any temple but then it makes people think it's an indian society which is not but it looks like that even in england they think the hari krishnas are indians the, the local people yeah i think that is a significant concern and it's almost like a catch 22 situation for us in, in the western world that we need some people to come at least and if indians are coming we don't want to we certainly don't want to stop them from coming but then the just the fact that if there are too many indians then local people don't feel very comfortable coming over there so yeah. that is that is itself a challenge so that's why we need you know like uh dr viksha uh dev amrita swami made his loft program in new zealand and they just invite young people and they don't have deities and the indians don't come <laughs> and then when they get cultivated they take them to the temple the indians also can become very very good devotees like well you know everywhere in india and in middle east do miraculous things but oh. people like you know birds of a feather flock together in language together it's one of the things we have to overcome that is very true huh? and in our own tradition, we have to see these are spirit souls that krishna brought them here you know when we're preaching we have to keep it krishna brought them here we don't care what kind of person they are krishna brought them so they're chosen <laughs> hmm so it's very interesting and Of course, a really big issue is Indonesia, where I went, and that's oh. a long story. Okay, so because they're Hindu by Bali is Hindu by so-called Hindu by culture, so uh, we got grew very very quickly, and people really liked it. Okay, so overall, if I understand right, what you're saying is that. in these parts of the world people are you could say it's not just from, from the self help or self development avenue it is also from the traditional cultural avenue like temples and uh, like going to temples for praying and worshiping from those avenues also people are interested yeah okay yeah. but you know we can't compete with these really opulent buddhist temples that have many acres of land and big banyan trees and you know crematorium right in the middle of it and everything with deities all over the place you know <laughs> right we can't compete with that but uh, mm. but we can meet people and give them you know krishna when people ask me what's the difference between buddhist and krishna i just say krishna that's the difference you know 
Otherwise, they have the four regular, you know, to, in, in their scripture, they have four regular principles. They have all the behavior and supposed to be mercy and all these things, but they don't have Krishna. You know, this is what we have as different <laughs> anywhere. The supreme personality of God. We, I, you know, as preachers, we have to have faith that we really believe it and that we can see these are spirit souls. They're not Chinese or Japanese or Thai or whatever. They're not Buddhist or Christians. I mean, they're spirit souls. So and overall, the tenor that I'm getting from, Maharaj, from your discussion is that, that maybe are we overestimating the need for adjusting according to time, place, circumstance? We focus more on connecting at a human level then whatever, whatever adjustments may be required, they will happen organically. And we, because how much to adjust according to local time, place, circumstance, that itself yeah. is a big discussion in today's world. And not just in, in ISKCON, well, not just, I would say, discussion, but even confront debate in today's ISKCON world today. Okay, well, some places there's legal restrictions, so we have to follow that very carefully. But... Uh, at least my opinion, and you know, this is we're supposed to have the most personal philosophy. So we have to get through to people to the heart, touch the heart. Uh, you know, and there's it's not through rituals and formalities that you do that. And then as far as organizing, the local people know how to do things in their place, so let them do it their way but let them do it for Krishna. Hmm. They know how to, they know their country. They know what you get, what they can do. They know how to do it. And we have to let them do it, but we have to catch them somehow or other and teach them, connect them to Prabhupada and let them read Prabhupada's books, you know, get, start following the sadhana and, and they'll take care of the rest. Can't say you have to do this way, you have to do that way. You know, when they want to learn deity worship, of course, there's technical rules and regulations and stuff, but how to organize and how to deal with the local people, they know. We don't we can never learn from a book. <laughs> we should try to learn. I I should have taken the time before I went to Japan to seriously study the language, but I didn't think of that. Nobody told me that. Like the Mormons. They have super language schools for any of their missionaries before they go out. Sorry, what do Intens they have? I didn't get that part. Intensive language school for the country language they're going. School. Yeah, for the country they're going to. Oh, okay. They have the former missionaries that been to that country teaching, you know, about these people and what you need to say to them and stuff. And they're very advanced. Okay. But, you know, as far as management, every country, is, they have their way of doing things. And we can't impose my way, which is probably I'm not good at that anyway. You know, when Americans try to impose their way in any country, it doesn't work. They have to let the local people manage on the ground. All the, you know, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, everything, they all manage by the local people. So, but we have to be we have to be loving representatives of Krishna and connect them with Krishna so they can teach that. That's otherwise, you know, we don't have a society. Relationships, we have all these relationships seminars. I heard one you gave, you know, many are giving, right? Hmm. Why do we have problems in relationships? You know, because we're on the bodily platform. That's Ultimately. interesting. So, so, what you're, if I understand right, Maharaj, what you're saying is that uh, that Prabhupada also had to some extent like a decentralized approach, where he, from what I read, Prabhupada spent a lot of time in India, because in India often the devotees would get. Uh, get uh, say cheated with uh, exorbitant prices being charged 
but prabhupad let the devotees in the west lead the preaching and he did not he did not get involved in the nitty gritties of management in the west as he did in india so in one sense what you are recommending is broadly following what prabhupad did in in his outreach also isn't yeah it? in everything he did you know internally and externally if we can do that we'd be you know we could have the whole world in our hand you know sorry what do you mean by internally and externally in this context well prabhupad was so also absorbed in in krishna and scriptures and loving you know everybody he was really doing that and although he was managing also with incredible astuteness you know i just been reading giri raj book about bombay you know prabhupad never lost a beat but even after dealing with mr nair in fighting and so much trouble he go and give a sublime class mm. because he was always really depending on krishna so he was teaching by example and we have to depend on krishna when we try to do anything in any country the people deep down everybody's a spirit soul everybody's the same they all have the animals also everybody has the same emotions the same basic needs they're just caught up in the different coverings of the mind working in different ways that's so, significant again so uh, if i understand uh, again if you understand right what you're saying is that there is a view do often emphasize prabhupada's internal mood of being absorbed in krishna and his uh, his capacity to you know, just uh, as you said completely get connected with krishna after dealing with managerial issues wow. but uh, so that ba- that balance between internal and external is of course very important but here what you are yeah. saying is that if we are reaching out to a large if we are going to reach out to a if his con is to be a become a global movement then we need to give some amount of uh, say freedom or leeway to the local devotees to know to decide how to adjust things or uh, how to present yeah. things that's being discussed in the gbc at the moment and the catholic church they say they do that you know because even moral values and stuff different countries have different ideas and you can't impose you know the american way on everybody the, the philosophy one it imposes on everybody but how to deal with different things that are coming up you know that so propod was cuz we can't imitate propod when you see how expert he was at all kinds of things he never studied he was definitely guided completely by the super soul but but he took advice from local people and you know when they had he let the local people go and bribe the politicians and stuff to get permits and, you know. mm. the voters couldn't do that the foreigners can do that that's amazing yeah. and overall if if uh, so if you know based on your experiences in you know i may have two three more questions before we conclude so uh, okay. two three so one is based on your overall experiences in uh, uh, spreading krishna consciousness so would you consider this to be the probably prom- most important thing that is required that developing personal relationships with devotees yeah yeah then would that also mean that uh, maybe we need smaller groups like you also mentioned study groups or something like that because when a big temple comes up individual devotees sometimes get lost or when people start belonging to a bigger group then the then the intimacy or the the close connections that are there they are sometimes get lost so how do we balance between say doing big projects and uh, maintaining personal connections yeah that's why uh this bhakti vriksha you know that's what it's all about and it was taken from a christian thing they call the cell church you know about that oh. sorry what the cell church 
cell church or is that something similar it's to like your body is your body is made up of cells okay and they work together so they make these cells and actually jai patakamaka's mother gave him the book which is called knocking on door opening hearts or something and about the cell groups that just some christians have and the most successful churches you have to belong to these groups at maximum 16 members and they have to make a new group if they get up around 12 they have to start thinking who can be the leader to start another group and the church is based on that those are the ones that are very successful so mm -hmm. he changed the name to bhakti vriksha and instead of calling it a shepherd he called it a some kind of leader you know but it's the same basic idea you have a smaller group that gets together it's informal but they just study it's not a long long meeting you don't have a big big feast or anything snack and they all become friends and the, and the christians they group them up you know lawyers doctors nurses unwed mothers you know all these different groups children where they get the same kind of people together where they can relate to each other and be very comfortable and talk about the same problem the engineers the it people these they have separate groups but then when they get a lot of those they make the big churches so in india of course you can build a temple first people like that but, and then they make a lot of devotees because they have these smaller groups oh okay everything has to work together mm -hmm. that's my i'm trying i haven't succeeded in many places but yes my gosh we have to be available you know, in these big cities it's so hard to travel so we need the online is helping a lot but we need many centers where people can easily access and just even if it's just a small group a few people but they need a, the structure you know they're studying Bhagavad Gita they're studying something about the Vriksha like in Japan one Japanese girl she moved to Mayapur like way long ago she's one of the first devotees and got married there and she designs it all around him out of his clothes after graduating from Japanese fashion school. And, but then she studied everything and now she's teaching Bhakti Shastri and everything online to the Japanese, in Japanese. And they love it. You know, and it's oh. growing, it's pulling people in. So, but that group studying Bhakti Shastri, they become good friends. And they're, they're all taking the exams and all going to the same classes. And, and then they become very strong and they become very attractive and they want to do more. Some of them will become teachers and just keep spreading. So we need temples. We need formality. We need, you know, but it's not that we need Prabhupada in America. He, he didn't stress building so many big, big temples, but devotees did it anyway. And then they get stuck sometimes with the burden of maintaining. Mm. Last night here in Brooklyn, everything got flooded. The subways cool. were flooded. The temple room was flooded. Everything was flooded. It's all dried up now, but there were huge rains. and some hurricane. And the ceilings leaking, the roof is leaking, you know, you got to be fixing things constantly. But home programs are, don't cost anything. Everybody has their home already. So nobody has to fundraise or worry about getting the money to pay the rent or anything. Hmm. And gradually it's become like a couple of these devotees in Japan and they're teaching Bhagavad Gita, they're teaching music. They get supported also without trying for that. They're just trying to outreach and people support them because they like what they're getting. Mm. And they come to the temple and they support the temple also. 
they make the temple alive, new people coming in. That's true. So overall, it seem it does seem that uh, we need to. So wherever the te big temples actually have structures by which devotees can interact with one another and develop relationships, that means smaller groups or something like that within the temple structure, that is good. Otherwise, it could it could lead to sort of too much of institutionalization or or even alienation, and that needs to be avoided. Yeah, it becomes impersonal, you know. Yes, Swami, that's true. So, so you need both. You know, people come and we need big festivals where there's a lot of devotees all together. But then we need many other programs to, like I keep telling the devotees in Africa, the Christian church, there's so many of them, you know, but they all have a signboard. Monday morning, this Tuesday, Monday night, this this seminar, this every day is a different program, you know, and so it attracts people to come. Different different people come for different things, so we need to offer all kinds of things. You know, I went to one Christian church in Hawaii. Monday night was women's substance abuse night. Tuesday was men's substance abuse night. You know, Wednesday was unwed mother's night or something you know they take care of people <laughs> my god unwed mother's that's night what, that's a that's, that's what a the real world issue. is full of. the world's issue. full of those people now you yeah. can't reject can't wait looking for pure devotees you know Prabhupada just took anybody who would come and listen mm. you know for living in the temple and everything we had to be more careful but so anyway, we got to be personal. That's true. So basically, uh, where people and, are... You know, that's just prejudice. Oh, I want to think I'm a sannyasi. Everyone should listen to me. But with new, even with old devotees, you can't be like that. You got to get down on your knees sometimes and connect with people. You know. Oh. That's true, Maharaj. So this is... Art to heart. Yeah. So this so is I'm this is very to, sorry. I wish I could do that. I I guess I had a little success someplace. Oh no, the fact that for decades you have continued on and that things are picking up despite there being so many challenges, that itself is remarkable. Yeah, numbers are there, so it looks like something, but I know it's not me. It's Krishna, but that's your humility, Maharaj. Krishna also needs potent instruments. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing your experiences today, Maharaj. Generally, Thank you for giving yeah. a chance. I hope it's not yes, too much. I mean, no, no, it is wonderful. Probably hear about Africa <laughs> and Israel. And... Oh, maybe we could talk about that in some other podcast in the future. Yeah. So yeah. I usually toward the end, I try to summarize what we discussed. Should I try to do that, Maharaj? Or would you like to add something? Yeah, you can do that. Yes. So generally, um, so today we discussed broadly on the topic of Krishna consciousness in, in Southeast Asia, we could say broadly. So you focused mainly on Japan. And then we discussed a little bit about other places also, China and Thailand. So you, you told about how you know, after the post Prabhupada departure, uh, post Prabhupada phase of ISKCON, because there was so much confusion, you and chaos, so you felt you go to some other place and just focus on direct, uh, directly sharing Krishna consciousness. You started from the from the grassroots in Japan, you know, making the first devotees and distributing books and uh, things like that. And over the years, things have been growing, and. Uh, we talked about the economic bubble growing and then bursting there. And now there is a younger demographic, which is so significant channel seems to be the yoga channel, where by which people are coming to us quite a bit. And they see they, they are interested in learning about the Bhagavad Gita. So if we can just uh, present the Bhagavad Gita, if we teach the Bhagavad Gita systematically, then people do take up and grow. And it's remarkable to hear about how yoga teachers themselves like Buddhist monks are 
taking Bhagavad Gita in hundreds and significant numbers and they are they are sharing it and also your devotees who are yoga teachers or in general yoga teachers also doing that so yoga seems to be a big means in the contemporary world to reach out to people in japan then I also talked about eventually whether it is your kirtan also is quite big yoga or kirtan eventually we need to develop personal connections with people and that, so the temples are not so much temples are important more as centers for education and community development and not just for uh, for ritual centered around deity worship of course deities are important but we need to have the perspective the priority is clear and then think um, in japan well there is no uh, while people still ha- there is a older crowd who has respect for monks and because of the buddhist tradition and they are quite open and the younger are more interested in in as you said yoga and through that self improvement and in general i think two three things which struck me were one was that we pro- we as a we provide inspiration and overall spiritual spiritual substance and then let the local devotees decide how best to present so several places where you mentioned about how the yoga programs are going you said that you know you have left that to the discretion of the local devotees to present and position appropriately so that model is i feel it's also very sustainable because otherwise it becomes too much pressure on the leader and then also you mentioned about china there it's through again kirtan and yoga is kirtan and yoga are the ways by which we reach out and there is a significant interest even though officially publicly we can't do anything but privately individually there are books being printed and distributed also uh in thousands and uh, either it's not that there is threat actively but it is more of just discretion is required as long as we are responsible uh, a responsible citizens law abiding then we can pursue krishna consciousness and then you mentioned about thailand and how there it's more of a traditional cult- traditional culture people are interested in praying in temples and people are reaching out to uh, as all reach, coming to arts centers also over there and then toward the end what you focused on is that uh, whether it you gave us example of several churches and how they offer very uh, you could say very they serve people's human needs the substance abuse or unwed mothers and things like that so basically we need to become friends of people and have a loving connection and prabhupad you told about that incident how prabhupad had those that whole family of five black people immediately he welcomed them in the temple and initiated them in uh, it it was in dal texas the whole point is that prabhupad the devotees were attracted to prabhupad not because he had so much knowledge or he so cuttingly refuted others but because he he connected with people with through compassion and love and if we do that seeing everybody as a soul and avoiding prejudices so the prejudices may come because of our own past uh, pre krishna conscious conceptions or sometimes even within krishna consciousness we may develop some stereotypes but by that we can all move forward yeah. and uh, we can all share krishna consciousness and overall it does seem that things are moving forward in a, a optimistic way in a wonderful way as uh, the numbers of book distribution is growing and people are becoming interested so if we can maintain that mood of loving connection and help people feel a sense of uh, personal belonging then krishna consciousness does have a bright prospects and uh, much to look forward to any things you would like to add in conclusion maharaj not add but that we have faith that the holy name alone can render all benediction on humanity at large and that all these good things that are happening in the world like vegan is 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 a good and bad but you know environmental things uh, people are being more kind they're talking about that they're trying to be that you know yeah uh, they're having night clubs with no alcohol and it's all because of the sankirtan movement that's keeping kali away from those people so they can do their thing and if we have full faith in that and and just try to encourage and do whatever you can to spread the chanting of the holy name you know that'll control your own mind 
and that's what's going to help everybody. Otherwise, we can't help all the homeless people. We can't help all the cows in Vrindavan. You know, we can take care of a few, but it's the Sankirtan movement, which includes all those things you said, being loving everybody. That's, you know, Prabhupada. Everybody just that remembers Prabhupada, just remember it's the first time I ever felt loved in my life, you know. He loved me, he didn't love, you know, my face or my hair or my muscles or anything like that or my fancy dress. He just loved me. And he was completely personal. It's like everybody in a class with Prabhupada thought he was talking just directly to me. Hmm. Yeah, just like Krishna eating lunch with his friends. You know, and a mystic power. And he was. He was talking to everybody intimately because he just knew the needs of the soul. So we can learn that from his book. And you're doing so much, you know, much more than me. And oh my God. so many so-called second generation devotees, who knows how many of them were Prabhupada disciples or Prabhupada had it. Prabhupada, you know, and are just now empowered to do such amazing things all over the world. The devotees are doing so much. And thinking of, like you say, bridge preaching, but, you know, it's just preaching, but just how to reach out to more and more people, you know. Mm, yes, Maharaj. Thank you. He went to America. He didn't know who he was thinking he'd preach to the educated people in, in the so-called high class, but who came with all the hippies. But the hippies turned out to be like dynamos, you know. Because they said they knew what was wrong and he had to teach them what was right and then let them do it and let them distribute books in any way they wanted to and any way they could. And, you know, the results came in. We made a little disturbance here and there, but in the long run, it's all good, you know. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. And then, you know, get over any difficulties because Indians saved the movement in Europe and America by coming forward and being able to donate. Then we have to deal with the fact that how to cultivate the local people in a room full of Indians. But we can do that just by keeping separate rooms a little bit and having special classes. So... Yeah. Thank you very much for this. And, Thank you very much you know, the, for your kind association. This podcast, a lot of young devotees are doing incredible podcasts, you know, bringing up a lot of things. And I think, I hope a lot of the older devotees watch them and see what's going on. Find out how a lot of young devotees are doing really amazing things that are not getting publicized anywhere because they're kind of off and farmers and everything. So all these things we want to do, you know, <laughs> got to keep talking about, we want farm projects, we want not only big temples, not only distributing books, but we want everything. Prabhupada had big vision. Thank you very much. I'm Thank you, Adash. Amazing how we couldn't get together online. The first time it said, waiting for the host to start the meeting. <laughs> and then I tried to do something else at the same time, which usually on Zoom doesn't matter. And I lost it, but maybe it was still there. And that's, but then it just kept saying wrong password, wrong this, wrong that. <laughs> so anyway, it worked out. Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Few languages there, spasibo. And I'm always the stupidest guy in the room because I have to have a translator for everything. Oh, well, it's a challenge because you have to depend on the translator and you don't always know what they're saying till you learn a little bit the language or know the person really well. So that's another challenge. Krishna covers it. Gauranga. Gauranga, Maharaj. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Thank you very much. I look forward to your association you. in the future again sometime. Again sometime. Yes, Maharaj.
confusing. 